senior director. Ah, thanks, and somebody remembered to put him. Evan is the senior director at the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, and he's going to speak to us today on their renewable renewables program. And uh, he also leads the organization, I believe, on demand response, energy efficiency, and electrification. Uh, we appreciate it, your being here and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your presentation, Evan. Great, well, thanks, Mike, for the intro and uh, thanks everyone for uh, the invitation and for, for being here today. Um, I'm happy to share with you all uh, the work that we undertake at the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. And I've got some slides here um, and I'll give a, a brief overview. It should take 20 or 25 minutes. Um, and then we'll have some time for discussion or, or Q&A. Um, feel free to uh, put questions in the chat as, as we go along here uh, so you, if you don't lose it in your mind. And we can follow up with that um, uh, at the tail end of, of these slides here. So um, I will jump right into it. Um, so I am the senior director of our renewables program here at BEF. Um, there are three of us here shown on the screen uh, as a part of this program. Um, as an organization, BEF works in the areas of energy, carbon, and water. And we have a fairly large watershed stewardship program uh, that works across um, habitat restoration and leverages uh, corporate donations to restore uh, dewatered ecosystems. We have an energy education program, uh, which is called CE Clean Energy Bright Futures, which engages educators and provides them with tools and curriculum to teach about energy in the classroom. Uh, we deal in environmental products, which includes renewable energy certificates, carbon offsets, and water restoration certificates. And then our renewables program, which is really focused on uh, breaking down barriers to renewable energy adoption. The, our program has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, BEF is a 22 year old uh, nonprofit. And um, uh, in our early years, we really focused on demonstration scale solar projects. And we did uh, projects on probably over 300 schools uh, small scale projects that included uh, energy education for the educators there. Um, today, this is what our program activities uh, look like. And we um, focus on consulting with our utility partners um, on all types of renewable energy projects. We support electric vehicle programming with those utility partners and the communities they serve. We assist tribal nations in developing renewable energy projects as well as electric vehicle infrastructure. And we've been focused on expanding the access to solar and the benefits from solar for uh, disadvantaged communities and households experiencing low incomes. Um, our program is supported um, by a majority of our funding from the Bonneville Power Administration uh, we are an independent nonprofit and we share a name with BPA, but we are an individual or an independent uh, actor and um, we use some of their funds to achieve these programmatic goals that I've just described. <clears throat> um, so this is you know, an overview of the types of partners that we work with and what we uh, can provide to them. And so I mentioned a lot of them already, the tribes, affordable housing, utilities, school districts, um, other nonprofits, businesses. And um, you know, we bring a, a variety of resources and expertise to the table to help our partners achieve their goals around renewable energy, demand response, electrification, uh, clean transportation. And um, you know, myself, I've been here at BEF for about eight years. Prior to that, I was in the solar industry where I worked uh, in a number of roles from operations to engineering to project management. Um, 
deploying solar projects around the country. So we're able to offer that uh, practical expertise uh, to our partners and help them um, do preliminary designs, you know, do procurement, um, do budgeting, leverage other sources of funding, um, all to help them uh, deliver projects as um, cost effectively um, as possible. Uh, our low income solar work has really been um, the bulk of the distributed solar that, that we've been engaged with over the past few years. Um, and you know, we really feel like uh, we can offer up uh, quite a bit of um, experience and resources to partners um, that may want to take action and may want to do solar, but don't quite know where to start or how to put all those pieces together. But um, there's a, a ton of barriers that have uh, resulted in this inequity of who benefits from solar and the incentives that are available. And so we're trying to address that head on by uh, seeking out um, policy change and funding that can be um, made available to these projects and increase the value to uh, these communities that we're working with. A couple examples of the projects that we've supported uh, of late. Um, most of these were uh, multifamily affordable housing developments. Uh, one on the left was out in Baker City, Oregon, and it was a, a property supported by uh, the USDA. They have um, a rural development division that subsidizes housing in, in rural areas. And that was one of the first solar projects on one of those types of properties in, in the country. Uh, and so we, we attempted to prove out a model where USDA can approve these types of additions to these properties, um, which you know, have all kinds of uh, budget restrictions on them. And so we hope that we see a lot more of those uh, nationally. The second project here was in Southeast Portland, the Jim and Sally's uh, apartments. And we collaborated with Rose Community Development to get uh, several sources of grant funding. And we put solar onto the roof of this uh, complex, about 17 residents live there. And through the state's community solar program, all of those residents will be able to receive uh, bill credits on their utility bills uh, without having that solar directly feeding uh, their, um, uh, their meter. Um, it, this one was also one of the first um, in the country to uh, apply for US Department of Energy weatherization funds. So we were trying to open up a new source of funding for these types of projects uh, with, with that DOE source. And then the last one there was a mobile home park down in Saginaw, which is um, near Eugene. And uh, this property was purchased by St. Vincent de Paul of Lane County. And they rehabbed the facility, put in a community room, playground, uh, repaved it all. And they had some excess acreage there um, where their pro uh, property was only zoned for 40, um, 40 of these uh, residents. And so they had some extra space and we worked with um, St. Vincent de Paul and the Oregon Department of Energy and got this system funded. And the local utility Emerald PUD um, also provides bill credits to all of those residents now um, where you know, they couldn't put um, solar on their mobile homes or trailers, but this shared facility now can benefit the whole community there. Uh, tribal energy projects. Uh, this is an example of one uh, that we supported with the Blackfeet Nation uh, in Montana. Um, many partners came together to make this project happen, uh, secured uh, philanthropic grants and um, some funding from US Department of Energy. And this is another instance where the utility was in a very supportive position and will be enlisting tribal members and providing them with these bill credits on their bill from uh, a large array uh, that was put on uh, the local tribal school there. Uh, the Quinault Indian Nation um, was another uh, great project there on the uh, central coast of, of Washington. They're in a very vulnerable position um, at the end of the utility line, they experience frequent outages 
and they're also in the tsunami uh, hazard zone, and they're in the process of um, relocating their entire village of Tahola to higher ground. And so they're very concerned about energy resilience. Um, in a Cascadia event, you know, utilities told them that they could be without power for up to two years. So uh, with this project, we were able to uh, combine solar and storage at one of their community centers uh, to provide them with some uh, resilient backup that could you know, serve that community long term uh, in the event of that kind of disaster. Um, and there's a, there's a cool YouTube video uh, you can check out uh, after the fact that really describes uh, the project and the process and um, you know, how that community responded to this opportunity. Um, staying with this theme of community solar, um, we have been active in Oregon's state uh, community solar program, which has been almost five or six years in the making now, but has been uh, in operation and, and projects have been uh, constructed and are providing these bill credits to folks all around the state. Um, uh, coming up now, some of the rules have changed in the program. Um, and, and some have uh, progressed very positively from our perspective. Um, now, up to at least half of each project needs to be subscribed by residential customers. And the amount of discounts for low income uh, participants in these projects was greatly increased. So we hope to see that um, you know, encourage more, particip more broad participation in the program uh, rather than just uh, business and government projects. And we've been um, active in developing projects as well, um, along with our partners. And uh, I'll pro provide an example here of a few of them in a second. But uh, we've been looking to develop uh, community shared solar projects in the city of Portland that can leverage the new Portland Clean Energy Fund dollars and work with our other nonprofit partners to enlist their, uh, their clients and their communities to these projects and receive the utility bill discounts that we've been working for. Um, we have a project um, out near the Portland airport on Port of Portland property that we are waiting to hear uh, about a funding decision on, which could benefit um, up to 200 families with, with deep utility bill discounts. And we're talking about families like, like I described previously, you know, that are in multifamily housing or mobile home parks. Um, PCEF also has priority populations that, um, you know, include black, indigenous uh, communities of color and low income households. So those would be the primary beneficiaries of these types of projects. Um, Example of just some of our community partners that have supported this work over the years. Um, you know, we've got funding from folks like Bank of America and Meyer Memorial Trust. Um, we've worked with USDA and Multnomah County, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, community development corporations, and, and many, many others that I don't have enough space on the slide here to list. So uh, moving on from our community solar work, um, Utility EV programming has been um, a real big focus for us over the, the past few years. Um, you know, electrification and uh, leveraging the assets that our utility partners already have has been a very attractive proposition for them. Uh, most of the utilities we work with are consumer owned utilities and they get most of their power um, needs supplied by the Bonneville Power Administration. So it's already very low cost hydro and very low carbon. And um, they're not so much interested in building new wind and solar for their systems that don't really need the power supply, but they're very interested in leveraging that low carbon resource uh, to decarbonize other end uses like uh, transportation, um, you know, other appliances, um, energy storage, et cetera. The first, um, area of work that our program embarked on in the EV space was uh, doing a benefit cost analysis of, of what an EV looks like to the utility. And is it, is it a burden or is it an asset? And, and we found that there were actually pretty substantial 
um, net positive economic benefits to um, our utility partners. And it ranged from anywhere from $300 to $1,000 per vehicle, per electric vehicle that was brought onto the utility system, simply in terms of, of more revenues provided to that utility from the charging that occurs for those electric vehicles. If the utility manages that charging and shifts the, the charging sessions away from the peak periods of demand on their system, that can uh, multiply those benefits. And so that's why we can go from, you know, uh, present value of $300 per EV to $1,000 for a utility if they're actively managing when it charges. So it can be, um, you know, a better symbiosis with the electricity system. We also have a low carbon fuel standard in Oregon, it's the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. And um, that can also provide another several thousand dollars, depending on your credit value assumptions um, for each electric vehicle. And the credits that are generated in this program accrue to the utilities. So this is you know, uh, thousands of dollars per vehicle that the utilities can monetize and reinvest into electric vehicles and the associated infrastructure. So uh, some pretty um, encouraging and definitive findings from, from that study. Electric tractors has been another um, uh, fast growing area uh, that we've been working on with several other nonprofits um, in the region. Uh, fourth is a nonprofit focused on um, clean mobility, Sustainable Northwest, uh, Y East RCD, and BEF have all partnered and procured uh, the first electric tractors that have been uh, delivered into Oregon and are being demonstrated around farms uh, as we speak with, um, with ag producers. And it's, um, it's early days for this technology and the types of models that are on the market are very limited. We're talking about 40 horsepower equivalent um, units, but the prospects for um, emissions reductions, uh, O&M and fuel savings for the farmers and improve health and safety for the staff on these farms um, is all very promising. And we conducted uh, another um, uh, total cost of ownership analysis that um, OSU just completed. And I think they'll be um, rolling out a press release here soon um, that showed even today um, with relatively low volumes and relatively higher costs of these electric tractors, they're pretty close to the same total cost of ownership as their diesel counterparts. So with a little bit more cost reductions on the manufacturer side and with potentially some incentives, um, they can become the more cost-effective option. But we don't quite know what jobs these electric tractors are, are good at doing. We know they can't you know, plow a, few, a field for 12 hours a day, but when it comes to spraying or mowing or harvesting operations, um, that's where we wanna get the practical experience uh, so we can you know, inform folks if um, buying one of these models makes sense for their farm operations. So uh, you can learn a little bit more on, on the website there that I've linked. And uh, I, I shared the slides with, with Mike and uh, he can distribute those if uh, folks are interested. Um, it was mentioned that offshore wind is um, an area of interest for, for this group and it, it is for us as well. Um, recently, we sponsored uh, POET, which is the Pacific Ocean Energy Trust, and their website is linked there, to do a, a convening of utility stakeholders to um, discuss and learn about uh, the offshore wind potential for the southern Oregon coast, and even, even up into Washington. But there have been some recent studies done by Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, and others that have analyzed um, the opportunity for offshore wind uh, for the Pacific Northwest. And, um, you know, it, it still is early days and we may be 10 years away from uh, seeing these in production. Um, but, you know, Europe and the Northeast of the US have seen deployments of offshore wind. And a lot of those are fixed bottom where they are anchored to the seafloor. 
but this floating offshore wind technology has been uh, progressing uh, very quickly as well. And the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management should be um, offering up leases to this type of activity uh, off of Oregon here uh, in the near term. And so what, what this resource um, could provide to the Pacific Northwest is um, a, a whole shift in how power flows in our region. Currently, a lot of the generation comes from uh, the east side of the Cascades and flows west into our metropolitan centers. What this resource could do is essentially serve those metro areas from the other direction, while at the same time alleviating a lot of transmission congestion uh, of power trying to go east to west. And so that has a lot of uh, value to the system in the sense that that's um, you know, less transmission you need to build, it's less energy storage or other resources that you need to build. And it has um, relatively high capacity factors out there in the ocean, which means that they run for um, a large percentage of the year. And, and that's, uh, that's a good thing for our system when we have more and more wind and solar that um, obviously doesn't operate all the time and has lower capacity factors. So this is a, a long-term uh, you know, um, market that will need to mature, um, but potentially has quite a few benefits to the region and to decarbonization. Um, they're also talking about coupling hydrogen production to uh, offshore wind and renewable hydrogen, which is the splitting of water with electricity has been really one of my main focuses over the past four or five years. And I've, I've circled the areas here that, that we have focused on, but there are so many different directions one can um, you know, go or analyze or research as it pertains to uh, renewable hydrogen. Um, you can see here in the, in the middle, we've got hydrogen and you can see the role it plays in coupling the electricity grid to all of these different end use sectors. And you know, if we want to decarbonize all these sectors, um, we need to do that through a clean source of electricity. Some sectors can be um, directly electrified or you know, use batteries like for electric vehicles, for example, but other sectors might be better served with uh, something like hydrogen, which is another form of electrification. And uh, you can see here uh, NH3, is the ammonia uh, bubble that we have circled here, which is already a, a massive uh, market for hydrogen today. And really one of the only ways to make uh, synthetic fertilizer, which, which feeds the world and um, supports our global food systems. And so, you know, that's one industry, for example, where uh, something like renewable hydrogen will be the only way to decarbonize that sector. And there's other examples here that, that you could dig into uh, deeper, such as you know, metals refining, um, synthetic fuels, and even hydrogen transportation for light, medium, and heavy duty applications. This is uh, just an interesting little graphic. So a, a fuel cell is basically uh, the reverse of an electrolyzer. Uh, an electrolyzer takes an electric current and splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. And what a fuel cell does, is it takes hydrogen from your, your tank, from your fuel supply, combines it with oxygen from the atmosphere, and it makes an electrical current here. And you can see as the protons pass through this membrane, it's the electrons that uh, pass through the circuit here to generate the current. And the byproduct of both of these processes, the electrolysis and the fuel cell production of electricity uh, have heat as uh, a byproduct as well, which can be harnessed and, and used if you have a, a need for that heat. So transportation is um, an interesting application for, from our perspective of hydrogen for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one of them being that uh, it, it pencils out um, relatively well compared to some other end uses, um, just given the relative cost of gas and diesel, especially today. 
um, but also those low carbon fuel standards, which provide really significant incentives for uh, cleaning up the fuel supply. And, and those markets exist up and down the West Coast today from California to British Columbia. Um, but one of the other reasons hydrogen is attractive for transportation is it's the lightest element in the universe. Um, and this graph just shows if, if you want a pure battery electric vehicle and you want to go far, further, you need more batteries, which increases your vehicle weight, which decreases its efficiency. And that's just not the case for hydrogen. So if you have a vehicle that you want to go far or move a heavy load or have a, a busy duty cycle, you know, a, a truck that runs, you know, two or three shifts a day uh, that you can't afford as a business to have sit around and charge, um, hydrogen works well in all of those applications, even though it's less electrally uh, efficient compared to directly charging a battery. Uh, this is a, a projection from California, and this was a UC Irvine uh, study that projected the hydrogen demand across various sectors. You can see we've got light duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, heat um, and, and process fuel, uh, power generation and energy storage, oil refining and ammonia production, all stacked here up in 2050, with, which you know is just orders of magnitude more demand for hydrogen than where we're at today, which is virtually zero for all of those sectors. So um, they are projecting you know, massive scale up of hydrogen supply and demand in the coming decades to meet the, uh, the decarbonization goals of all these sectors. <clears throat> so here at BEF, we've been trying to get renewable hydrogen projects in the ground. And um, we're proud to be a partner uh, with uh, these other organizations here with Douglas County PUD and Toyota Motors North America. We were able to secure almost $2 million in grant funding uh, to deliver the first hydrogen vehicle fueling stations in the Pacific Northwest. That was leveraged by another $4 million from the state. And Toyota will be donating 10 of their fuel cell electric Mirais uh, that will be utilized by our, um, the host sites for our fueling stations, but also loaned out to local fleets and policymakers to increase the exposure to the technology. And all of these stations, uh, so our first station that we had funded has now expanded to three stations uh, one will be located uh, in Chehalis at a twin transit facility. They're the local transit district there in Lewis County. And the other stations will be in East Wenatchee uh, managed by Douglas PUD. That PUD has embarked on building their own renewable hydrogen production facility right next to one of their hydropower dams. And so they're able to now take low uh, cost or low value hydropowered electricity and turn it into a higher value uh, renewable hydrogen fuel. And so they, they're currently in the process of building out uh, five megawatts of electrolysis and thinking about expanding that facility further uh, given the demand that they're seeing today. Um, only a couple more slides here. Uh, the other project we were involved with was the Pacific Northwest Renewable Hydrogen Action Plan. Um, which you can look up and, and read about, but really convened a bunch of stakeholders uh, regionally and nationally around what actions the Northwest should take uh, to advance this market and how to do it uh, effectively given where we're at today. Just recently, um, the state of Washington passed um, a piece of legislation um, that really took a lot of the recommendations that came out of this report. Um, really focusing on hubs and ports and clusters of hydrogen production and utilization, and also created an office of renewable fuels in the state of Washington and allocated a few million dollars to support the application of the Pacific Northwest to um, a federal DOE opportunity to uh, build out hydrogen hubs nationally. And there's uh, over $8 billion available to hydrogen infrastructure that will be coming uh, available soon. 
And I will close it up there. Um, a little bit of a whirlwind, tried to give you an overview of, of everything that we are involved with. Um, so I will leave it there and I'll attempt to address any questions you may have in the chat or feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and we can have a discussion about anything I went over. <clears throat> Evan, um, this is Anton Schmidt. Uh, what about localized production of, of um, hydrogen, you know, for, for example, a, a transit district for their buses and their trucks? How will that be managed? Uh, can they get a local hydrogen production unit um, to supply their uh, vehicles? Yeah, so the short answer to that is yes. It's technically feasible. All the technology is commercially available and it's been done. There's a transit agency in Palm Springs, Sunline Transit, that has their own electrolyzer and fueling uh, dispenser for their own fuel cell buses. And they've, they've received both deliveries of fossil hydrogen and now they have their own supply of um, electrolytic hydrogen. The, the cost drivers for doing that really are almost entirely dependent on your cost of electricity. So um, you can do that, but you're going to likely be paying higher retail prices for electricity, whereas some of the developments that people are looking at today are really focused on large scale new wind and solar uh, that doesn't even touch the electrical grid that can basically take that low cost wholesale renewable power and, and turn it into hydrogen fuel. And it can be more cost effective to even deliver that fuel long distances than on-site production. Okay, now that's interesting. Thank you, um, I appreciate that. Um, who, who would we contact in that regard? Can we contact you? Um, I'm happy to follow up with you. There's lots of other folks doing good work on, um, tr uh, fuel cell buses for transit, uh, CTE, which is the Center for Transportation and the Environment. Uh -huh. uh, they're really one of the foremost experts on that type of application in the country. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Hi, right, Evan. Yes. Uh, Tom McNulty with Auburn Brew Renewables. Th thanks for your presentation. I, I found it all fascinating. Um, are you comfortable that codes and standards for safety are advanced far enough to support this current rise in, in interest with regard to hydrogen? Um, you know, not, not being a, you know, uh, fire protection specialist or, you know, I'm not an engineer by training either. Um, you know, I can't speak to the intricacies and nuances of that, but personally I'm, I'm comfortable with how commercialized all this is to date. I mean, uh, we produce like 200 million tons of hydrogen currently today uh, in the U.S. and it's you know managed and distributed and delivered and used uh, just as safely as our other energy sources. So like, is hydrogen inherently more dangerous than other fuels? Not if you follow the the and there are codes and standards that exist today. Um, and it's the same thing with ammonia. You know, we make a ton of ammonia. We we use it as fertilizer. We transport it globally. It's a global commodity. Um, you know, yes, it can be dangerous, but I don't think we're you know behind the eight ball in terms of uh, safety practices today. All right, thank you. I'll get some hands up here. Let's get to the yeah, Alan. You got your hand up first. Okay, thanks so much indeed. Um, I, I've been very excited by the potential for hydrogen um, because of all of the benefits, obviously, of it being. The product being water, but I, a friend uh, introduced me to an, uh, a, a report of a study that was recently released. It's 2020, 2022 study, which um, discussed the negatives of hydrogen leaking into the atmosphere and resulting in a whole bunch of atmospheric chemical reactions. One of them, which uh, I just noticed, was 
that uh, a series of reactions result in methane being a much more longer lived gas than the current expectation. Are you familiar with that? Um, are we concerned at all about hydrogen leakage um, as a negative? In fact, I think the summary was that hydrogen could be 11 times worse than carbon dioxide or something like that. Hmm. Um, I have not done the research on this one and obviously it's fairly new. Um, I, I don't know if much science has been done on it, to be honest, you know, this is maybe one of the first to analyze that. Um, you know, my, my uninformed sense at the moment is that, you know, one, hydrogen does have the potential to leak being a very small molecule, but two, it's also very valuable. And so you're gonna wanna minimize leakage as, as much as possible. And then, you know, lastly, um, it's, it's hard for me to envision a scenario where if we switched all of our pipelines over to hydrogen, that the leakage of hydrogen into the atmosphere would be, would be any worse than the current leakage of methane. Um, so, you know, is it, is it the perfect solution? Maybe not, um, but I think it's gotta be a, a, an improvement just from what I've seen. We have Ron. Ron, yeah. Hey, this is Ron Davis with Emerald People's Utility District. And I, I, th I th think it's great that you're looking at the hydrogen. It makes a whole lot of sense, but like everything else, nothing's perfect. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have looked at any uh, alternative batteries, like uh, the zinc air battery that New York's power authority is supposedly using. Hmm. Um, you know, energy storage has not been a big focus of ours for a variety of reasons. But, you know, one, we're, we're a small nonprofit. Um, we have modest resources um, and we don't really get involved with like R&D um, uh, type endeavors. We, we try to work on what is commercially viable. So, you know, if it's, if it's a new battery technology, we'll let, you know, the national labs and, and the scientists figure out um, if, it's, if it's worth deploying. Um, so that's one, you know, one part there. The other part is that batteries are really expensive, regardless of what type you want to you deploy. And it's really hard to get them to, to pay for themselves. Um, you know, it's hard to cycle them uh, often enough to create significant value. And, and currently most of the value from energy storage uh, is for resilience, which is really hard to, to monetize. So battery storage has not been a core focus of, of ours. Hydrogen can play a role as energy storage, but um, it's one of the many, many roles it can play. You know, it can be demand response for utilities. Um, it can be vehicle fuel. It can be um, you know, resilient backup power. So, um, you know, I am not an energy storage uh, expert and we, we don't have the financial means to really um, make a huge difference there. Uh, I got a question here from Conrad in the chat. Uh, do you have any examples where BEF has influenced policy to make the integration of renewables easier or more cost-effective? So that's, that's a great question, Conrad, and you know, I, I'll go back to highlight that um, a majority of, of our renewables program funding comes from the Bonneville Power Administration, which um, explicitly excludes us from participating in lobbying. So, you know, we're a bit unique in, the, in terms of an environmental nonprofit that we are not necessarily an advocate that is, you know, lobbying for new environmental policies or regulation. Um, the, the few areas of policy that, that I have personally been involved with have been related to the Oregon Community Solar Program and was more on the ad administrative rulemaking side of things, so not the, the legislative side. Um, and then, you know, the example I gave in Washington, which was the um, Renewable Hydrogen Action Plan was really you know, a convening, uh, an outreach and education type exercise, um, which then uh, grabbed the attention of some state legislators who, who took it from there. So um, th those are two examples. We do have some uh, more active 
um, advocacy in the water space, particularly in the Southwest and Arizona around the Colorado River, which is, you know, and, and Lake Mead, which are basically drying up as we speak. Um, but that's that's really kind of a whole different program and, and outside of our um, regional and BPA focused work. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another one in the chat here. Um, I, I don't really know if I have much to say on atmospheric removal of, of methane, you know, other than to say, um, we're probably going to have to remove some CO2 or emissions from the atmosphere. You know, I, I read a thing the other day that said, um, you know, even if we do that and pull uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, that the oceans might equilibrate and, and release some of their carbon <laughs> into the atmosphere. So I'm, I'm not sure what the latest science says on that particular one. Uh, Evan, uh, this is maybe a little off the subject, but uh, I uh, associate BEF with uh, uh, buying certificates to reduce my uh, contribution to uh, global warming. Uh, could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, uh, we have several folks in our organization who um, uh, broker renewable energy, energy certificates and carbon offsets. And so a lot of our, our customers for those products are our companies, uh, some individuals. I think we're one of the few um, sellers that allows individuals to come onto our online store and, you know, you can offset your, your ski trip your, or your airline flight or your, you know, annual home, you know, stove cooking emissions with, with our carbon offsets. Um, and so there, there are a variety of different types of offsets and a variety of sources, you know, where they come from. Uh, the same with the same with RECs, renewable energy certificates. Some can be you know local to the Pacific Northwest. Some can be you know Texas wind projects. Some can be um, you know South American rainforest conservations, um, where they you know protect a forest that might have otherwise been deforested, and they generate uh, carbon offsets from that. Um, and so. You know, we have a lot of um, business clients that want to um, meet sustainability goals, want to reduce their emissions, want to procure more renewable energy. And, you know, this is one way to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's a way to do it without uh, changing your current, you know, business operations. It's a way to kind of get at the lowest hanging fruit, the most cost-effective measures first. Um, but ultimately, it, you know, buying recs and offsets it is not going to get us to net zero emissions. We need you know, um, real infrastructure built in all of these sectors to uh, dramatically reduce the emissions of these businesses. Any other uh, folks want to jump in and ask a question? You, you guys are getting so technical in the in the chat questions. Um, I'm going to have to spend a whole weekend reading all of these uh, these studies just to just to understand some of these. I'd, I'd like to say I'm I'm really enthused by the the uh, support of of local communities that you're providing. The, the uh, low income folks really do need the help and, and I like like to see that there's somebody that's addressing that directly. So yeah, just just applause, not a question. Well, I, I appreciate that comment and um, you know there there has been major shifts over the past five years, you know the focus on equity and, and diversity. and you know, Unfortunately, organizations like ours have traditionally been, you know, uh, white led and, and focused on, you know, kind of um, more privileged uh, community. And, you know, if we're going to, as a society, um, you know, really coalesce and move things forward on clean energy and decarbonization, we're, we're going to need much more broader support. Uh, and so communities that have been left behind or don't feel like this movement is relevant to them 
uh, you know, are going to be less likely to help advance the cause. And so, um, you know, building a more inclusive movement is certainly, um, you know, a part of our work and our focus. I figured out how to turn that into a question. <laughs> uh, since you are working with those communities, it seems like one of the ways of empowering them is to teach them to do it yourself. Uh, ha have you had any experience with that? Do you have any opportunity for that? Absolutely. You know, that is the, the concept. Um, but again, you know, there are many barriers uh, from getting where we are today to, you know, fully empowered uh, communities, you know, and capacity, expertise, funding, you know, all of those factors play into that. We try to fill gaps where we can, and in some cases it's funding, in some cases it's, uh, you know, technical expertise. Um, but it's, it's a challenge, you know, especially for, you know, small communities, under-resourced communities, um, you know, nonprofits with, with low budgets, like having the capacity and the staff and the, the um, long-term stability to work in these areas is, is a challenge. And, um, you know, it's going to need a lot of attention to kind of build that up, build the capacity of communities and nonprofits to get more engaged. Have you been doing <laughs> webinars? Um, I do do webinars. It's uh, not in a consistent location, but it's, um, you know, by invitation, I've done them with, with Forth, I've done them with uh, the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, uh, for a while, I was the commercial development chair for the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, and we held webinars every few months. So um, no shortage of webinars these days in this virtual world. Are you publishing them on your website? Um, not on our BEF website. You might be able to find them out there somewhere. Okay. It'd be nice if you, you just uh, consolidated them. Sure. Kevin, uh, my name, I'm Bob James. I'm with ESF. And I, I was just wondering, on, uh, with regard to POET, uh, what do they predict the, the economics of offshore wind to be uh, with the floating platforms and uh, do they think it will be viable economically? I know it can be done, but can it be done cost effectively? So um, it's a great question. If, if you really want to dig down, I'd suggest you, you peruse the studies that have been recently published. Um, PNNL and NREL have, have some good ones, and I believe they have cost targets for those. There was a webinar the other day that I attended where I think they were talking about 50 to $60 a megawatt hour for the price of offshore wind by 2030, which is when it could feasibly uh, get built just based on BOEM timelines. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, higher cost than terrestrial wind and solar, um, but, you know, cost is meaningless in the absence of value. <laughs> And so is it valuable enough to our system? That's, that's really the right question, because what it can do is it can eliminate the need for new transmission build out, or it can fill in the generation gaps when the terrestrial wind and solar aren't producing. Um, is it cost effective compared to natural gas generation? Well, in the past, maybe not so, but by 2030, given what we're seeing with natural gas, it, it could outcompete that as well. So it's, it's certainly within the realm of reasonableness, um, but I don't think everyone has quite quantified what those values are to the electricity system, but uh, it appears to be you know, in, in the ballpark. Well, thank you. And, uh, any suggestions on, on how an organization like ESF can work with you? Well, um, we are always happy to discuss um, new project opportunities. So, you know, if you're out in your communities and you hear of somebody wanting to do, you know, X, Y, Z project, and if it's, you know, relevant to the work that I've described here, we're, we're happy to talk about that. You know, we're, we're very project focused and we um, highly value the learning by doing. 
Um, so that's why we focus on that more so than advocacy. Um, if, if ESF is primarily advocacy, then there might be you know, less opportunity to collaborate. Um, but you know, we're always happy, happy to talk. And if we can help um, you know, achieve uh, the goals of, of our partners, whether that's through you know, funding, expertise, grant writing, you know, et cetera, um, we're happy to have those discussions offline. Thank you. Um, so I'll try to, we've got a few more minutes here. Adam had a good question here in the chat around the round trip efficiency of hydrogen versus batteries. And, um, you know, this is really kind of the, I guess the first intellectual barrier to, to address um, when you're thinking about hydrogen for transportation versus um, just electricity to charge batteries. And it's, it's really kind of a matter of scale. You know, it's very easy to uh, plug in a battery electric car to your home or anywhere. We have ubiquitous, you know, plug-ins, right? It's very difficult to do that with a hydrogen fuel cell car. You know, in, in Washington, we're rolling out, you know, uh, six to $8 million worth of infrastructure just so we can fuel the first 10 uh, fuel cell vehicles, right? So seems to be even a, a bad value proposition there. But when you're talking about thousands and millions of vehicles, now all of a sudden you're gonna plug all those battery electric vehicles into the electric grid and you're gonna start triggering transformer upgrades, substation upgrades, transmission upgrades, additional uh, generating resources to supply that increased demand because the transportation market is, its scale is immense, it's huge. Um, and so you're gonna have to rebuild our electric grid and the generating resources many times over. And that's a- so The energy has got to come from somewhere, right? So you're not, just, you're not just gonna pull the energy to make the hydrogen out of nowhere. It's got to come from somewhere. You're not, right? but envision, you know, new wind and solar out in Eastern Oregon, and you want to get it into, you know, Southeast Portland to charge the TriMet buses. You know, it's got to travel all, all across those electrical lines, whereas you could directly create hydrogen out there and truck it in or bring yeah. it in via a pipeline. And so now all of a sudden what you've also done is you've, you've decoupled the the time-based demand of the vehicle from when the wind and solar produces. So you don't need to have that coordination anymore because you have the hydrogen as the battery in between. Yeah, I got you. But I mean, and obviously there's a benefit to that, but is it worth throwing half your energy away basically? Uh, the short answer is in some cases, yes, it is. Uh, because, you know, think about, um, the efficiency is irrelevant if you're not taking into account economics, right? So like if you have excess solar in the middle of the day, um, you know, you're gonna curtail your solar plant. So the value of that energy is zero. Well, even even it, at low efficiency, you're making hydrogen from that, you know, you're, you're coming out as a positive value. Sure, sure. I, I, yeah. The, the thing that, that hasn't been tapped is that if you had all your electric vehicles when they're idle plugged into the to the grid, you've got a huge, you know, sink that's just waiting there to take the energy. Um, that is a good opportunity, and and you know we we looked at that value for our managed charging study. The scale isn't there for a fully decarbonized uh, energy system. You know, even if you we're able to leverage all the batteries from a future EV fleet. Um, it's not enough energy storage to, you know, capture July sun and use it in like a December snowstorm. Um, you know, you, you need the cost of storing energy via batteries is it becomes um, way out of the money when you're talking over those long time scales or at the, the scale of capacity that we'll need. Uh, to decarbonize electricity, transportation, and all these other sectors. It just seems that, that there's got to be a better way to do storage than hydrogen. I mean, pump storage, flow batteries, there's lots of stuff out there that 
you know, seem that has just, you know, just as much potential, but way higher efficiency than hydrogen. You also have uh, a lot of barriers as well. You know, pump storage is not an easy thing to build. Like no, nobody builds new dams anymore. And that's essentially what pump storage is. Um, and, you know, so those projects take, you know, 10 to 15 years to even get permitted. Um, hydrogen is um, cost competitive with all of those other long duration storage technologies you mentioned. And, you know, currently they're storing it in underground salt caverns. So just like natural gas is stored today, um, you can engineer a subterranean cavern to store all of that gas very cost effectively. And there's a project in Utah that's doing that currently where they're converting some coal fired facilities to natural gas and hydrogen combustion turbines. So you can blend hydrogen with natural gas uh, and the fuel to supply those turbines will be stored underground in a, in a salt cavern. Um, and that's currently the most cost effective way to store hydrogen that we know of today. Yeah, because you could store it at lower pressure. You don't have all the, the, the compression and refrigeration losses. And yeah, and you have tremendous volume too, you know, compared to a like metal cylinder. Well, Evan, it's uh, one o'clock or just about one o'clock. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, you'll probably be hearing from some of us with follow-up questions. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to follow up uh, at any time, uh, unless you um, ask me to read all of these scientific articles. That <laughs> <you read>. uh, <laughs> but thank you guys for the great conversation and all the um, uh, very incisive questions. Um, and yeah, happy to follow up uh, with any of you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Evan. Great. You guys have Thanks, a good Evan. Good work. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Good to see you. Bye.